from songbirds to salamanders, bats to bullfrogs. Get your questions ready and give our panel of experts a call. The Kentucky Wild Call-In Show starts right now. Yeah, we got one. Sweet. Got a muskrat? Yeah. Good job. <laughs> what do you know about that, man? That's a good fish, man. Nice male, small mouth, healthy, pretty color. Cody, here. Find us one more good pheasant, Cody. As biologists, we, we catch ducks and we place bands on them. And it's just a really excellent place to see cottonmouths. What do you think? Like bull. That was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Tonight, we are coming to you live from the KET studios in Lexington, Kentucky to answer all of your non-game questions. So we're talking about birds and bats and fishes and all those good, all those good uh, species. I've got three experts here with me. First off, I've got Kate Slankard, who is our avian biologist. How you doing? Hi. Next, I have Monty McGregor, who is our mussel biologist. And you brought some, uh, you brought some things to demonstrate here a little bit later on. And last, I have John McGregor, who is our state herpetologist. We've called this show in the past many different things. It's been the non-game show. It's been the wildlife diversity show. And really, we're covering all the species that, that we do not hunt or fish for in the state of Kentucky. These are the species that you see out there that makes a hunt or a walk in the woods more enjoyable. And they're extremely important. They can be for showcase uh, overall health of the environment. They can be indicator species. They just all work together in the ecosystem. The Department of Fish and Wildlife actually has a program about these other species called Kentucky Wild. Can you tell me a little bit about that, Kate? Yeah, so this is a new program. We're really excited about it. Um, it's basically a way for people to get involved with our uh, projects and programs. It's a membership program. You join online and um, a membership gets you the opportunity to participate in some of the field work we do. We have different events for Kentucky Wild members, like for instance, uh, one of them is going out to Monty's Mussel Hatchery and taking a tour. Um, we took some uh, folks out last week to catch birds, you know. And so it's, it's a way for folks to contribute to what we do, but also get involved with what we do. You know, I get asked all the time, what can I do to help out? And we, we've always told people in the past, buy a hunting and fishing license, because every, all the research that's done here is, is funded by fish and wildlife agencies. <clears throat> if you don't hunt and fish and you still want to help out, this is a great way to get involved. And to learn more about Kentucky Wild, you can search for it by going to the website for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. That's fw.ky.gov and search for Kentucky Wild. All right, we've already got a few questions in. Please give us a call. You can reach us at 1-800-944-4664 or you can submit your question via Facebook. Let's get started here. We've already got a couple questions here. First up is Bob from Jefferson County. Uh, wants to know if Kentucky has rattlesnakes, and if so, what kind of rattlesnakes? Well, actually, we have two kinds of rattlesnakes. We have the pygmy rattlesnake, which is real rare in the state. It's only found in the southern part of Land Between the Lakes and in south, southern Callaway County, and you hardly ever see one of those. I haven't seen one since 1975. Oh, wow. But our major rattlesnake is the timber rattlesnake, and it's all over the state except in the bluegrass. Um, pretty common in parts of eastern and southern Kentucky and the land between the lakes. And in Jefferson County, uh, Jefferson County Memorial Forest has a population of timber rattlesnakes. Okay. So uh, if you want to drive Bear Camp Road and go up into the, into the knobs of Jefferson Memorial Forest, you might actually get a chance to see a rattlesnake. So we do have snakes, Bob. We've got two and some of them are your neighbors, which that's a good thing, right? If you see, if you see a snake, it's uh don't disturb it, it's, it's probably not gonna bother yeah, yeah, rattlesnakes are not aggressive. Um, they pretty much only bite if you're trying to catch one or kill one, mm -hmm. if you step on one. And the last two deaths in Kentucky from rattlesnake bites have been those snake handling churches where people were passing them around and the people bitten didn't seek treatment. And, and if you seek medical treatment, you will not die from a timber rattlesnake bite. 
All right, next question is Turner from Frankfort, Kentucky. How many kinds of bats live in Kentucky and which species of bats is the most rare? We have 15 different kinds of bats. Um, many of them are quite common. Uh, several are rare because of the white nose fungus disease that's killing them when they hibernate. Probably the rarest bat in Kentucky would be the, uh, the Seminole bat, which is a bat of the deep south that's just moved into the state in the last 10 years or so. It's kind of a global warming type species, and they've showed up a number of places across the state now. Okay. The next question is actually about bats as well. Addie uh, from Pleasureville, Kentucky, Addie Couch, wants to know uh, how you can tell if a bat has rabies. Is there a test to tell if a bat has rabies? <clears throat> Not really. And, you know, if, if a bat is, is uh, flying during the day, that it's suspect. Or if it's on the ground and, and just isn't acting normal, uh, what you need to do is get the bat to the state rabies lab, and, and they take a section of its brain, and they can actually test it for rabies. Don't handle the bat. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, if you need to pick up a bat, get a coffee can and a piece of cardboard and scoop it into the, into the coffee can. Don't ever touch a bat or try to pick it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sharon from Paducah, Kentucky. What type of bird box is made from a PVC pipe? Okay, uh, this is a, a type of box we've been busy putting out on a lot of our wildlife management areas that have mm -hmm. um, wet areas, and, and she may have seen one uh, for a prothonotary warbler, and that was actually something we did a Kentucky Field episode about um, a few months back, and so that's a, a small yellow warbler. It's a species of concern, and they like those PVC boxes, which last a long time on our WMAs, and so that's why we put them out. All right, fantastic. Um, Lauren from Marion County says she has owls nesting in her silo, an old silo. It wants to know if there's something that the department would like to know about. Yeah, that's definitely something we'd like to know about. Um, it sounds like it could be a barn owl. Barn owls um, pick strange places to nest, often uh, man-made places, and they love old silos. Um, there's not much else that'll nest in an old silo except for maybe a vulture. So if you have owls nesting in your silo, I'd sure like to know about it because a barn owl is a rare species that we have a research project on. And so we do try to um, you know, keep in touch with landowners that have them to see how they're doing. And you and I actually did a segment on barn owls. You, you brought one out and we played some video or some sound, some audio of what a barn owl sounds like. Yeah. Very interesting, isn't it? Very weird birds, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you, if you got one, you're, you're, you hear it, you're gonna know that's what you got. And it is something that we do wanna know. We even mentioned it in that segment where we are doing some research and Definitely. wanna know if you have nesting barn owls, right? Yeah, if you have barn owls, we'd like to know about it. All right. Uh, Don and Joe from Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, wants to know what they should do if they have bats in their house. What if you have bats in your house? <laughs> there are actually companies and people who specialize in bat exclusion, and uh, <clears throat> they have ways to trick the bats into flying out and not being able to fly back in. So uh, our department does have a list of qualified bat exclusion people, and so if, I think if you go to our website, you can get to that okay. or call our information center. All right. How can you tell the different species of crayfish apart and how many species of crayfish do we have here in Kentucky? Monty, welcome to the show. Here you go, here's your question. <laughs> well, we have over 60 species of crayfish. We've had a couple of new ones described just in the last, last few years. Uh, there's a lot of different features that you use to distinguish them. Uh, some of them are the claws and the, the, the little bumps that are on the claws. They have spines on the side. Uh, there's also the, the, the legs, the shape of the legs are modified on the males in particular and you use those features to separate them. So there's multiple uh, things, uh, sometimes color, um, most of the time it's not color. Really, a lot of times crayfish are uh, real specific in their distribution, so if you're in a little spring in, let's say, western Kentucky, uh, there's probably only one thing that lives there, so you can kind of just isolate by distribution, but there, there are several characteristics. The rostrum is a, is a good one. That's the, the thing that's on the end of the head. It's sometimes sharp and pointed, uh, but there are multiple features that you look for in, in separating them. And if, if, what are crayfish really good for? I mean, there's a lot of things that crayfish are important in our, for our environment, right? Right, they're, um, uh, one, they're, they're kind of a opportunistic feeder, so they will eat about anything. So anything that dies out on the bottom of a stream or pond, and you have a crayfish, it'll come and clean that up. Uh, they eat a lot of insects, they, they can eat plants. Uh, 
Um, they're very good about taking the first level of food and providing it to like predators such as fish and, and other in, uh, animals like hellbenders or, or even some mammals. So they're, they're the base of the food chain almost uh, and, and they really help transfer uh, food up the food chain. We recently did a show about fishing with crayfish. So fish, it's a great, it's a great food source for fish species as well, right? Very, very good source of protein for fish. And uh, hellbenders in particular, uh, which we haven't have a question on those yet, uh, but they, they love crayfish and do really well uh, eating almost entirely crayfish when they get a little bit older. Okay, all right. Brandon from Anderson County, what is the rarest mussel in the state of Kentucky? Uh, there's several of those that are, that are fairly rare. But I would say the one that comes to mind in particular is called the ring pink. Uh, there's only been four or five individuals found in the last 30 years, uh, mostly found in the Green River. Uh, we're hope to, hope to find some of those in the next few years and, and actually to raise some in our Center for Moss Conservation so we can repopulate the wild stock. But I'd say the ring pink's right there mm -hmm. with most of them. I tell you what, if you've never had a chance to go through the Center for Moss Conservation, uh, I know that you guys do have some tours. It's not open daily t for tours, so make sure that you call ahead. But if you get involved in Kentucky Wild, that may be a good opportunity, a good way to come down and see what Monty's working on. It really is uh, pretty much a one of a kind in the world facility, is it not? Or you guys are doing things there that really is not being done too many other places, aren't you? Right, we do, we do uh, quite a bit of work with conservation of the species. We're really studying the life cycle of a lot of these animals. It's unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to raise them in captivity. We're trying to raise these really in rare endangered species that no one's ever done before. So it is a challenge sometimes, but we, we uh, have some advanced technologies that other people don't have access to uh, that we've been studying uh, for about 10 years now. And so we, we have some things that uh, people come from all over the world to see how we're doing things. And it's pretty, pretty nice to be able to, to raise something that's almost extinct and, and have hundreds of them to put out, like the purple cat's ball, for instance. You guys have some species that you have uh, some, of, some of the largest collection in the world of some certain species of, of mussels, right? right? Yeah, the, the purple cat's ball is a good example. We have uh, pretty much all the ones in the wild and are in captivity, and we have we released 400 last year and getting ready to release uh, about 1,200 more this year. Uh, it's only one population left in Ohio. So it's a really rare species and we've been able to propagate and uh, hopefully restock some in the wild. Wow, very interesting. Jim from Logan County, is, uh, there is a creek that runs through their property where mussels used to be plentiful years ago and now there are none. Why? Perfect timing for uh, Jim's question here. Well, there's a lot of, lot of answers, um, a lot of things that contribute to that. Uh, but one word in particular is pollution uh, from a lot of different sources, either from habitat destruction, uh, herbicides, pesticides, um, sometimes uh, effluents from, from industries or whatever. Uh, runoff pollution is, is a big one. Uh, but there's a lot of those things that have contributed to the change in the habitat over the years, especially since about the 1960s and 70s. Uh, we've seen a, dr a dramatic decline across the state and uh, there's no one thing that I can tell you is, is a, a multiple things that have caused those declines. And erosion can be a big portion. portion erosion. Of erosion, yeah. All right, Ellison from Scott County uh, says she's not seeing as many monarch butterflies as she is normally seeing. She wants to know if, uh, if there's a decline and what could be driving that, so. Monarch butterflies have really taken a hit. Uh, their, their, their numbers <laughs> where they spend the winter in, in Mexico are way down. Uh, part of it is uh, apparently a disease that's affecting them. Uh, climate change may be affecting them. Mm -hmm. But we're uh, encouraging people to set up monarch way stations and grow milkweed plants and other flowering plants, particularly in the fall, that where the migrating monarchs can stop and, and, get, and get nectar. But the, the decline is being paid attention to. You know, and there's some of those out at the Slato Center, and I've seen some people that, uh, you know, a lot of people will, will put in food plots and all kinds of things, but it, to put in a, a, an area of milkweed or some native plants to attract butterflies is usually pretty successful. I mean, when people do that, they typically will see some, won't they? Yeah, you especially need stuff that flowers in the fall, like mm -hmm. white wing stem is a really good uh, nectar source for migrating monarchs. All right. Uh, Terry from Meade County wants to know if possums eat a lot of ticks. I've heard this as well. Who knows something about possums here? You know, I've heard that too, but I don't believe it. Uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, possum's going to groom itself. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, if there's something <laughs> yeah. on there, they're probably going to take it I off did, with I their mouth. I have to read up on that. So, yeah. Uh, All right. Larry from uh, Murray, Kentucky. Uh, here's a bird that calls Ricky, Ricky, Ricky. 
what kind of bird could this be? So he's saying that's the, the sound it makes. Well, my best guess is maybe a common yellow throat and what I think they say is witchity, 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 but maybe he hears Ricky, Ricky, Ricky. <laughs> and so that's a little yellow warbler. It's quite common and it has a, a black uh, raccoon mask. Okay, okay. You know, Laurel or whatever that was, everybody's, well, you, you hear different things sometimes. People, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, everybody you, hears He hears own. Ricky, you hear w Wickety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He knows what it could be, huh? Yeah. Uh, William from Muhlenberg, plans to control, uh, any plans to control uh, armadillos which are invading Kentucky? I think armadillos are great. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really neat that we have them, you know. Yeah. Uh, they don't really hurt much, you know, they, they, they root up insects. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they might tear up your lawn a little bit, but uh, they're pretty interesting creatures. And they are moving across Kentucky and Indiana and Tennessee. They're really expanding their range. So we're not doing anything to control them. And let's, no. let, let's make sure we clarify. You think they're great, and wildlife biologists think they're great. We are not bringing armadillos <laughs> into no, the state not. of Kentucky. <laughs> we're doing no stocking of armadillos. And there's some theories on how they're getting into the state, right? Uh, they're just naturally expanding. Uh, okay. They started in the very western corner of the state, like in uh, Fulton County, mm -hmm. and they've just moved moved eastward. Every time I go to LBL now, I see several armadillos. Okay. The reason you see so many run over on the road is if a car straddles an armadillo, when an armadillo is startled, it jumps straight up in the air. Oh, really? And if you drive over one, <coughs> you're going to get it. It goes straight up in the air and it punches a hole in the. Uh, in the shell and kills it. So okay. if you stop and look at road killed armadillos, almost every one of them is, looks like somebody smashed it with a hammer, but it actually, it's armadillo suicide, I guess. <laughs> All right, Mark from Marshall County wants to know when there's a good time to start taking down hummingbird feeders for the season. Um, you can keep your hummingbird feeder up until almost mid-October and you might get some late birds passing through. Um, it, it doesn't really matter too much when you take them down. Some people worry about um, them not migrating because you leave them up too long, but you can leave it up as long as you want. Mid-October would be when I'd take mine down. Okay. Joe from Jefferson County wants to know if the eagle population has increased over the last few years in Kentucky. Absolutely. Bald eagles are doing wonderful in Kentucky. Um, we have over 150 nests now, and actually they occur statewide. It, it used to be we had a lot of bald eagles in western Kentucky and not as much in the rest of the state. Um, now we still have more in western Kentucky, but central and eastern Kentucky have birds nesting too. Uh, just about every large reservoir or river has bald eagle nesting on it now, which is great. It's amazing how many eagles you can see by going out to some of our large reservoirs. Yeah. I mean, Green River, Nolan. Dale Hollow, Cumberland, all of them have bald eagles, don't they? Yeah, you just got to keep your eyes open and you'll see them if you're on a big lake or a river. Tom from Lee County wants to know how far the copperhead snakes travel in their life cycle. Um, he said one side of his farm, he didn't say how big the farm is, but he said one side has many snakes and the other side has none. I'm sure this is a habitat issue probably, huh? You know, it probably is, but you know, a copperhead's home range is, is maybe uh, 100, 150 acres and it spends pretty much its whole life in that area. So okay. So, it, you know, if it's rocky and wooded, it's probably good copperhead habitat. And then uh, a lot of times in the summertime, they move into fields where you have lots of rodents. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, one of the things they really feed on a lot are cicadas, which are associated with, uh, with trees. Okay. And they eat the cicada nymphs that come up, come up out of the ground. So they can live in the woods. And most, most snakes don't do real well in a in a closed canopy forest, but mm -hmm. copperheads do just fine. Well, Paul from Bullitt County wants to know if black rat snakes eat copperheads. No, no. It may be once in a while, but th that's a story you hear a lot. Mm -hmm. What really, what eats copperheads are black racers mm -hmm. and black king snakes. Okay. And to a lot of people, you know, a black snake is a black snake, but <laughs> the rat snakes almost exclusively eat uh, rodents and birds. Okay. Roger from Boyle County, will black snakes run off copperheads? Here we go. Is this a myth or is it true? Uh, they might not run them off, but they'll eat them. And, you know, a black racer, a black king snake, and a copperhead knows. He knows those by their odor. He sense it with his tongue, and they go into this weird behavior when there's a black racer or a black king snake. They'll puff up with air, and they'll start shooting out a loop of their body and try to ward it off. It's really interesting. Wow. 
So, and that uh, is, can you get one in here and get that demonstration for me? <laughs> oh, darn, I forgot to bring a copy <laughs> with me. <laughs> All right, Chris from Mercer County. Mercer County wants to know the name of the black snake with the ring behind its head. It's got a blue ring. That's called a ringneck snake. Uh, very common in the state. And a real big one might be 18, 20 inches long, kind of slate gray with a yellow or orange belly and a ring around the neck. And uh, very, very common snakes. I uh, had a friend who was a student at Moorhead and he was studying their food habits and uh, found out that one of the things they eat is roaches. Really? Which is, uh, that's yeah. interesting. That's, that's pretty interesting. They yeah. eat insects and salamanders and earthworms and slugs and all kinds of little critters. Interesting. Uh, Robert from Hen is from Henderson, Kentucky. Once we get this question every single year, we have this show. By the way, what has happened to the whippoorwills? Is anything being done to restore them? Yeah, we do get that question a lot, and we have the same concern he does. Um, it, everybody seems to have noticed a decline in whippoorwills and chuckwills widows in recent years, and. Um, so we're not exactly positive what that's about. We have a research project where we're doing surveys, trying to understand why they're doing better in some places than others. Um, it seems like it's probably an issue of habitat um, and, and maybe uh, it, they nest on the ground, you know, so they probably have some problems with ground predators, you know, uh, feral cats and raccoons and things mm -hmm. that maybe are a little bit overpopulated. But we are working on it. Uh, that was one of our new, newer projects, so we don't have all the answers yet. But I know that a couple of the shows that we've done this year where we were fishing at night out on some of the big reservoirs, we've heard quite a few. So I don't know if where, where, what part of the state where they tend to be not doing as well, but down on Lake Cumberland and Del Hollow, they tend to be doing pretty well. It seems like they're hanging on pretty good on public lands, and it's mm -hmm. the private lands where they're sort gotcha. of going away. People used to hear them on their farm, and they might not be anymore. So uh, that, that makes sense. Uh, jo Joseph uh, from southern Indiana and in Louisville says that he's not seeing the hawks that he used to see, especially uh, Deem Lake, which is in Clark County, Indiana, I believe, um, saying he's uh, not seeing any hawks. Are we seeing anything, any decrease in hawks? Um, well, with him being in Indiana, I don't, I don't get up that way that often, but honestly, most of our red-tailed hawks and red-shouldered hawks are doing pretty good. Um, if all of a sudden they stop appearing in an area, it's usually an issue of habitat, maybe, um, you know, if the land has changed ownership, if there's more mowing going on or something's been changed to row crop that used to be pasture, you know, hawks really like, um, areas that are kind of rough around the edges and have some grown up grass. And so mm -hmm. usually it's a habitat management issue if they That's stop coming around. The best time to see hawks, to see hawks visibly driving them down the road is coming up pretty soon, isn't it? Right, fall and winter is when we get a lot of hawks visiting the state. You yeah. will see them on, on the highways. They, they will definitely scavenge, won't they, on roadkill? And well, like and that. it's also the edge. They're looking for things to run out of the edge of the habitat. You know, mm -hmm. it's easy to see things run over the road and so. Mm -hmm. That's a great time driving driving up down any of our highways here in Kentucky. Just keep your eye on the on the on the edge lines, and you'll see some hawks. Yeah, lots of red tails. Yeah. Um, Richard from Graves County wants to know if it's legal to have a bald eagle feathers. Um, he has found some around his pond. It's actually not legal to keep them yourself. Um, if you find them, you can contribute them to an educational institution. You, you have to have a permit to keep bald eagle feathers, and that's just to um, protect the birds so that people don't, you know, you, you can't tell the difference between if somebody got the feathers in a, a nice way or a not so nice way. And so mm -hmm. um, if you find bald eagle feathers, you can contribute them to either, you know, the Slato Wildlife Center in, in Frankfurt or a nearby university or something like that, or you can just leave them um, leave them out in the field, but you shouldn't keep them yourself. And this isn't a state law. That This isn't a Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife issue. This is a federal law, correct? It's a federal law, and so you really don't want those to be in your possession, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jason from Boone County uh, wants to know an update on the red boxes in the trees. What are they targeting? I'm not, I'm not seeing the red ones. I saw the purple ones for a long time. We were looking for the ash borer, but I don't know about the red boxes. Any ideas what they're talking about? It, what kind of mussels are uh, up in the trees in these red boxes? <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> No idea. Bird wing pearly moth, right? <laughs> I'll tell you what, for any question that we either don't get to or you want, a, you want a, a better explanation, you can always call our info department and speak to a biologist or leave them a message and we'll try to get you an answer. Um, on this particular question, maybe take a picture of that red box and send it 
And you can call us and reach us at 1-800-858-1549. You can reach our info center. Uh, send us a picture of this box so that we can give you an appropriate answer because we know what it is. So not sure about that, right? All right, Mark from Hopkins County. How to tell a venomous from a non-venomous snake. I'm sure there's a multitude of ways to do this. <coughs> Know what venomous snakes we have in the state of Kentucky would be a good way to start, right? Yeah, yeah. we you have cottonmouth, copperhead, timber rattlesnake, and pygmy rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. All of them are pit vipers. Mm -hmm. So all four of them have a deep, heat-sensitive pit on each side of the face, uh, right between the eye and the nostril. Uh, they have kind of thick, more or less triangular heads. They have stocky bodies. Um, other than that... <coughs> just kind of go by behavior. You know, they, they, they tend to not run because they're either stocky and slow moving. So, uh, and if you, if you have one that's dead, you can look at the scales under the tail. Mm -hmm. In a harmless snake, it's a double row of scales behind the vent. And in a pit viper, it's a single row of scales. But, okay, okay. Uh, or just take a picture of it and email it to us and we'll <laughs> tell you what it is. That's, Jerry from Butler County, this, this is an interesting question. Monty, I guess this is a salamander question or one of you two. Wants to know if they come from underwater and grow wings and fly. So <laughs> I'm going to guess. Salamander? <laughs> that's what the question says. Jerry from Butler County wants to know if salamanders come from underwater, grow wings, and fly. Do uh, you, you have any idea what they could be talking about? Uh, nope, but the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Do they eat but, things that that hatch off the bottom and co and come up and like fly? He may be talking about a helgramite or some other uh, aquatic insect that actually would do that. And uh, there's nothing that's really that large. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we got a question here from uh, Harrison County. Do timber rattlesnakes in Kentucky or are there timber rattlesnakes in Kentucky? Can they cross the river into Indiana and how far can they swim? Uh, we have timber rattlesnakes in a lot of Kentucky, but not in Harrison County. They do swim. Uh, we've seen them crossing the Green River. I don't know if they could cross the Ohio River, but I don't know why they couldn't. Mm -hmm. But Indiana has timber rattlesnakes also in, in the southern part of the state. So, uh, Ed from Fayette County is wanting to know about black vultures. We get this question quite a bit, too. Is there growth in the numbers of black vultures in the state of Kentucky? Yeah, there absolutely is. Um, I've been here for about 12 years now, and just in my time in the state, I've really seen them um, increase. And so we didn't used to have any black vultures in Kentucky, and just in the past um, 30 years or so, they've really moved into the state and um, become a very common bird. Okay. Al from Barron County, uh, how can you attract crows around a, a flock of chickens to keep hawks away? So first off, I guess, having crows will keep the hawks away? Was that, is that effective? Well, I mean, crows will chase hawks away. Um, I, you know, I don't know that that's the best method of going about it. In all honesty, um, it, when it comes to hawks and chickens, the best thing to do when a hawk um, starts paying attention to your chickens is to keep your chickens on lockdown for a few days, maybe a week. Um, if the hawk can't get to the chickens for a while, it just is going to have to move on. It's got to find other things to eat. And so, it's good to have a way to protect your birds so that okay. the hawk will, you know. You starve them out. <laughs> yeah, basically, yep. All right. David from West Liberty, uh, when should you stop putting food out for hummingbirds? We've already talked about that. All right. Um, this is a Facebook question from Leanne. Are there any species of mussels that are detrimental to a small lake? So are there any, first off, you don't want to move species anywhere. Um, you need to know, we need to keep them in the, where they're supposed to be, but is, is there a particular species that is detrimental to small lakes? Um, she's talking about barren, which I guess she's considering that a small lake. Well, one that no, I wait a minute. Three acre lake. I just couldn't really read the handwriting. Well, one that I can think of right away is the zebra mussel. Uh, that's a species that's an invasive species that's come into the state in the last 20, 25 years. And uh, it, can, it can really devastate. Uh, it'll grow on anything hard surface. Uh, it can clog up pipes and things like that, get on your dock, get on your boats, uh, even canoes or whatever it might be. Uh, but that's one of the most devastating mussels that we have. The other species probably wouldn't do any harm. Uh, again, it wouldn't be good to move them. A lot of mussels that live in rivers and streams will not live in ponds and lakes. Uh, there are a couple species, a, paper, a giant floater, paper pond shell, that you do find typically 
in, in lakes and ponds, they come in when you stock your fish. They're actually on the fish. Uh, they're a parasite that lives on the fish. So uh, sometimes people ask, how do they get there? Well, if you're stocking fish, you're buying some fish from southern states or someplace, and you put them in, uh, sometimes the mussels will show up a few years later. You don't see them right away. They're small, but uh, that's how they normally get there. Okay. Will from Owen County, can you build a house for hummingbirds? No, you can't. Um, they nest in a really small nest, usually high up in a tree, and so um, they just don't use nest boxes. Okay. Uh, Sam from Mason County wants to know how long it's been since John has seen a hognose snake. You and I have had a conversation about a hognose snake <coughs> recently. How long has it been since you've seen one? A uh, couple of months. Okay. Uh, I don't see very many. I usually see three or four a year. And it's not that they're rare, it's just that I look for snakes under tin and plywood and old boards and junk and hog noses pretty much are in the open most of the time. So uh, It's a very it, interesting snake though, isn't it? It is. It's a fun snake to find. <laughs> <laughs> Bill you like Har being hissed at, you know. <laughs> oh, the, the, there's probably not a snake in the state of Kentucky that will posture yeah. like a hog nose snake, is there? No. Nope. They will hiss and carry on and flatten out and... I mean, it's all show, right? Yeah, and it's great. It's good theater. <laughs> <laughs> Bill from Hart County, um, how many bat boxes could you put out on two acres to help control insect populations? Apparently he's having a mosquito problem. He wants to see if he can use bats to control that. Uh, probably just one uh, or, or a small number. And a, a bat colony will pick the one it wants to use and, and will use it. Uh, sometimes they move back and forth between bat houses, but... I wouldn't put up more than a few. Okay. And they're not really great at controlling mosquitoes. Purple martins are much better, but uh, they are pretty good at controlling a lot of other insects. All right. Um, Sandy from Hart County wants to know what species of hawk lives below the dam at Kentucky Lake? Could be more than one, but what, are, are there any sightings of? Well, that's uh, interesting because we just learned that there's actually peregrine falcons that nest on that dam that we um, just found this year. We're really excited about, and so perhaps she spotted those. And um, we're not sure exactly where they're nesting, but they're nesting somewhere around there. And so that's a rare bird that's neat to see, and hopefully that's what she's seeing. Okay. It could be a hawk or two as well. I mean, red-tailed hawks could be located down yeah, there. Yeah, right? there could be red-tailed hawks or red-shouldered hawks, but... Hope it's With mentioning that, that, the dam, yeah, that's, that sounds suspicious that that might be what she's seeing. Very interesting. Uh, Bruce from Fayette County, uh, what part of the state are cottonmouths located? Uh, the western coal field and the Jackson Purchase, so <coughs> west of Owensboro, basically. Okay, west of Owensboro. Uh, and they live in really high quality swamps and uh, swampy rivers. Uh, Land Between the Lakes has a few cottonmouths and some of the swampy embayments. So western, you, western Kentucky. You, you've been studying cottonmouths for quite some time in the state, right? Yeah. But you have some places where you're pretty sure you can go and locate them, right? Sure. <laughs> I, I, have, I have good places where I can go if I want to look at cottonmouths. Fantastic. Roy from Lincoln County um, said he saw a solid white barn swallow, and he saw it today, and he wants to know how rare these are. Well, they're certainly not common. Um, just about any bird will sometimes... Uh, show you know albino patches or sometimes totally albino birds will um, show up and it's just a genetic abnormality and it's not anything we tend to keep track of or you know try to conserve but it's just a neat thing you know sometimes birds will come out come out white and so we don't hear of a lot of swallows though most of the time we hear about it in blackbirds and in hawks okay all right, Patty from Greenock County wants to know, if, is there a reason why she's seeing so many dragonflies this year? I haven't really noticed this, but uh, anyone noticing more dragonflies this year than normal? You know, I'm seeing about the normal number of dragonflies. Uh, maybe she's just noticing them, or uh, it's a seasonal thing, too. All the dragonfly species are their early spring ones and midsummer and, and fall dragonflies. Some are real colorful, but uh, they, they're really good mosquito eaters. So. Oh, really? Dragonflies? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, mosquito they hawk is another name, or snake doctor <laughs> is another name. I don't know where that came from. Okay. Um, looks like Copeland from Oldham County said he's been seeing a lot of Lone Star ticks this spring. Uh, can you talk in general about ticks, uh, how to pre prevent them, and when the diseases that they could possibly carry? Who knows a lot about ticks? 
I don't know a whole lot about ticks. Uh, he, I think he needs to get in touch with uh, an extension agent, University of Kentucky Department of Entomology. Uh, our vet was pretty good uh, in working with ticks, but she uh, she's moved back to Canada where she came from, and, okay. which is kind of a shame. So we do, we do have a lot of lot of ticks, and uh, and uh, our vet that just moved was doing a study looking at the uh, the boreal the bacteria that causes the Lyme disease, and and it was it's present in several counties that didn't think it was there. Uh, so it is it is a is it is threat that's common. Uh, uh, I have personal experience with that Lyme disease with my daughter, um, but anyway, it it is something you need to be careful of. Uh, there is some spray that you can spray. Uh, Let's talk you do, about that because we all spend a we spend most of our careers outdoors, right? Uh, what, do, what, do, what type of uh, measures do you take to uh, prevent ticks? Because I've, I've obviously everyone who spends much time outside has had a tick. And typically if you get them off pretty quickly, there's not a whole lot to, a whole lot to be concerned. But a tick, tick illness can be, can be pretty bad. What do, you, what do you do, Kate? Check as soon as possible after I get back and change my clothes, you know, and that seems to be the most helpful thing mm -hmm. to me. But um, also, I wear rubber boots when I'm out in the field up to my knees, and that seems like it keeps some of them off anyway. But. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other, I mean, I know they make some sprays, and obviously some of the sprays you read the back of the, the container, it might scare you a little bit about putting them on, but they work really, really well, and some of the stronger ones you just don't put on your skin, right? Yeah, I've been using uh, Repel with 40% DEET, uh, spraying my clothes, and then you tuck in your shirt. And, and that works pretty well. And there's a, a stronger pesticide that actually kills the ticks on your clothes. Is it? Uh, Permethrin, something yeah, like that? Permethrin or yeah, something like yeah, that? Yeah, permethrin or something like that. And I have a can of that. And uh, you read the label and you're scared to death of it. But, you know, you, you hang your pants up and spray your pants down and then it's good for, like you know, like 40, yeah, like 40 washings or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But the uh, first time I ever had that on, I was out photographing stuff and I sprayed my shirt and my pants and the, the tick repellent ate all the writing off the buttons on my digital camera. Oh, really? <laughs> it was very frustrating. <laughs> I could no longer figure out <laughs> what the controls were. I'd say if you really are concerned, though, you know, using some, some form of it and then checking, checking after, after coming in, making sure there are going to be a lot of times... Uh, on tight fitting areas or in the hairlines or just make sure you tight fitting areas on your clothes. Check that out and that's a good way to good way to yeah. control. My it. wife is really good at finding ticks on my back. <laughs> she was out of town last year and I had a tick. I knew it was back there and I couldn't reach it and I went to the medical center in Nicholasville and ended up costing I think four hundred and sixty four dollars <laughs> for five minutes in there and I identified I told him where the tick was, how to pull it off and identified it for him. <laughs> <laughs> and so my wife said, well, that gives me an idea of, of how much I'm worth. <laughs> Ch Chuck from Northern Kentucky, uh, this is a question for Monty. When and where can you find Helgamites? Helgamites are found in almost every stream we have in the state. Uh, it's a little insect that lives typically in, in riffles, which is the fast part of a stream. Uh, you can just go out and turn over or pick up a rock, uh, maybe a boulder the size of a basketball or a little bit smaller, pick them up, turn them over, and they're usually crawling all over those rocks. A lot of people use them to fish with. Um, but they're, they're found a lot of places. They like to be around organic matter, so there's anywhere there's leaf packs and nice quality streams, that's where you're going to find them. Okay, all right. Um, F. Jones from Lake Cumberland area, screech owl population, how are they doing and have they, have they decreased? They seem to me to be pretty stable. They're one of our most common owls, and um, you know they like kind of young forest. Uh, they need tree hollows to nest in, and sometimes they'll nest in uh, wood duck boxes or American kestrel boxes. Um, but we do we find them to be quite common throughout the state. Okay, and are they in every located in every county in the state? Just state? about, yeah. Yeah, they're really common. Yeah. Um, Jimmy Perkins from Russell County. Uh, here's a question for both of you guys. Want to know, uh, are there rattlesnakes in Russell County? Yep. All right, the answer is yes. And this, this fits in almost like he, Jimmy may have seen what you have here. How big do crayfish get? Well, some of them can get f fairly large. If you actually measure from the end of their claws through the tail, I've seen some that are almost 10 or 11 inches long, which is, which is pretty remarkable. 
Uh, most of them in general are four or five inches, the big ones that you normally see, but occasionally you'll see, see some like the red swamp crawfish or this one like I have today, it's a, uh, the bottle brush crayfish. It's one of the largest ones we have in the state and they can get fairly large and they're quite intimidating. If you try to pick them up, they'll take those pinchers, those kilo that they have and they will bring some blood to you and I've experienced with that for sure. <laughs> now this one you've got here, when I first seen it come in, I've, I've spent a lifetime in creeks and streams catching crayfish and uh, this is a pretty good size one, and you told me that they get quite a bit bigger than that. That's a, you said that's actually a smaller one, right? This is a this is a bottle breast crayfish, and uh, this is a female, but it's a small one. The, they will get at least almost three times as the size the big ones that I've seen. Uh, they're pretty impressive. It gets its name because of it has these furry and hairy antenna. It only found in the Green and Barren rivers. So if you're ever in the Green and Barren, you're canoeing and you see this giant, looks like a lobster, just walking down the middle of the stream. It's probably this bottle breast. So uh, it's an endemic species, only found there, so we like to leave them alone. Uh, they're the dominant predator out there sometimes, and they think they are at least. Uh, there's not a lot of things can eat them when they get that big, but they are pretty impressive. So you, you said that they can get, he asked about the largest one. Is this the largest species found in the state of Kentucky? This is probably the largest one we have in, in the state of Kentucky. And you're saying this is a small one? This was a small one. And you can see it's relative to my hands. How, what the size of it is, but they'll get about three times that size, the real wow. big ones. There you go. I'd say that, that, that that's a big one. People are going to want, next question they're talking about eating these things, get ready. <laughs> Will from Owen County, are there any copperheads in Owen County? You know, uh, I do have a couple of copperhead records from the northern part of Owen County along Eagle Creek, and they also should be along the Kentucky River uh, along on the hills. Uh, so, yeah, they're in Owen County, but in the farm country, probably not. Okay. Rob from Carroll, Carroll County, how many bugs, um, how many bugs, are, or more specifically, is asking about mosquitoes, can a bat eat in a daytime, in a day's time, so a 24-hour period, and then uh, how can he attract them to his yard in the city limits for eating bugs, mosquitoes? We you could buy that house that that <laughs> <laughs> woman wanted to get rid of the bats. There you go. <laughs> so, we, we've already said that bats may not be your best way to eliminate mosquitoes. So if you're trying to do something strictly for the mosquitoes, there may be a better purpose. Uh, uh, you may try to attract other bugs. Um, but to attract bats it would be to put up a bat box, correct? Yeah, put up a bat box. Um, <clears throat> there's a, there was a study done long ago on, uh, on a bat in captivity and it was released into a room full of mosquitoes and it, it ate 600 mosquitoes per hour. And so you see that figure all the time, you know, that bats eat 600 mosquitoes per hour. Well, yeah, they did in somebody's lab. Yeah, know. yeah. But uh, given a choice between one moth, eating one moth and, and chasing 300 mosquitoes around, you know, the bat will go for the moth every time. <laughs> I, would, I would guess so, yeah. It has to be easier to pick up on, on uh, <laughs> using their radar system yeah. too. Huh? John from Campbell County, mussels that grow in the Licking River, what are they? Can he transport them from the river to his pond? Is this legal or is it even a good idea? Definitely not a good idea. Again, I mentioned that earlier about uh, most of the mussels that live in the river wouldn't live in the pond. Uh, we have several endangered species in the Licking River, so definitely uh, just going in and collecting those would not be uh, advised. Uh, we have over 50 something species in the Licking River. Several of those are on the federal la listed as endangered or threatened. Uh, I actually have one with me from the Licking that's really common in the Licking, surprisingly. This is called the fan shell, and uh, this is a, uh, an endangered species that, that surprisingly we have the best population in the world in the Licking River. So that's a good thing that, to know that the water quality there is good enough to support this species. Uh, but we have lots of varieties. Uh, almost every riffle in the Licking River has over 20 different kinds of mussels uh, throughout its drainage, 180 miles of free-flowing river. Uh, we've actually introduced some mussels there as well uh, that are really rare and only found in other states, and we've brought them in to repopulate and make the Licking even better. Wow. So uh, someone that's wanting to bring those type of mussel species to his pond, I'm not sure what, it, what, it, what his desired result is, but do you, can you recommend any type of mussels that would be good for the pond, or you really don't want to put them in there if they're not currently there? Right, the only couple of kinds that live in ponds, the, the giant floater and the paper pond shell, and those are, those are found uh, in mostly other lakes and ponds, and those would be the only ones that typically would do well. 
Ponds are way different than rivers and lakes uh, because they typically get a, the very bottom layer is has no oxygen and that's where the mussels are living on the bottom. So these animals that are living in the streams, the, the mussels in the streams and rivers, need the oxygen. So when you put them in a pond, it's just a matter of time before they experience no oxygen and die. Okay, all right. So you don't want to you don't want to move them in there. It's one, it's not a good idea. It may not be good for your pond, and two, it's probably not going to live. Right? And as far as the re regulations go, you're not allowed to collect them anyway. Okay. Especially in areas where there's endangered mussels. Okay. Uh, you can't even have their shells or anything like that. Okay. Jack from Knott County, are blowing viper snakes rare in eastern Kentucky? And a side note, I think he's talking about a hog nose potentially. He is talking about a hog nose snake. He uh, said he has seen several of them. Very recently. Okay, that they're they're not uncommon. Um, they like kind of open areas with sandy soil or uh, open woods with sandy soil, and they are found in every county in the state. Okay, Jerry from Nelson County. This is a this is an interesting question, and I guess we're going to have to answer it in the water quality terms. What is the cleanest river in the state of Kentucky? That would be depend on what you call clean. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people, when they think when they think of clean, they think of clear uh, and aesthetically the way it looks. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. Um, so I would use more. Where is the best water quality stream? So typically, the best water quality we have is in the Upper Cumberland River system, in uh, usually the national parks and things like that where we have undisturbed areas. Mm -hmm. um, there's really not any areas that aren't, aren't disturbed somewhat uh, from like acid rain and, and other things. But typically if you're in southeast Kentucky in the mountains up high in the drainage system where, the, where most of the, the streams and rivers would be just rainwater that's not touching agriculture and urban development, things like that, that would be your best areas. And I would say, in general, the southeast Kentucky and the upper Cumberland River systems are your best areas. Okay, all right. Jerry from Nelson County. Oh, that's the cleanest river, sorry about that. Joanne from Jessamine County. How long do you have after being bitten by a rattlesnake to get the anti-venom? You, you touched on this a little bit, but tell us a little more uh, about yeah, it. Yeah, you, you, have, you have time to seek proper medical treatment. Um, you you want to get it as soon as possible, but uh, six or eight hours, you're probably okay. Um, and you talked a little bit before that there's only been a couple of deaths in the state of Kentucky. Yeah, uh, rattlesnake. In, in like the last ten years, we've had I think we've had two fatal rattlesnake bites, and both of them were uh, people who refused medical treatment. Very, very, so, very seldom is a rattlesnake going to strike you without some type of warning to uh, notify you there. Right? Well. <laughs> If you step on, squarely on a rattlesnake barefooted, it's probably going to turn around and bite you. But, yeah, yeah. You know, rattlesnakes are not aggressive. 95% uh, of the time you would recover without medical treatment, mm -hmm. but it's that, it, but you would have a lot of tissue damage. Mm -hmm. And that, it's that other 5% of the time, that's when the medical treatment is really important. And the, the uh, anti-venom is really expensive and you need a lot of it. You know, it, it's best to not get bitten by a rattlesnake. If you see a rattlesnake, just give it some space, and, and it's, you know, it's gonna it's gonna crawl off. It, it's uh, they don't they're not speed merchants or anything. But, uh, <laughs> All right, Fred from Boyle County wants to know why the department is interested in studying hellbenders. What is what does hellbenders tell us? Well, hellbenders are really rare in. Uh, a lot of their range, and there's a, a pretty big push to put them on the endangered species list. And we have been studying hellbenders pretty hard for about 10 years, trying to find where they are in the state and uh, document reproduction. And really, our best source of information about hellbenders is fishermen. Because really? we have a little note in the fishing guide, you know, if you find, if you catch one of these, please take a picture of it and send us a note. And in the last five years, we've probably gotten 30 photos of hellbenders from fishermen, and it's a much better source of information. I mean, biologists go out and look for them, and you know, we spend three or four days and don't see a single one. So, uh, what was if you were going to go look for hellbenders? What river system would you go to? In Kentucky, yeah, I, I would probably go to the Green River in between Green River Dam and Mammoth Cave National Park. Okay, okay. Because I've heard some stories of some people that work for the department seeing hellbenders in Nolan, Green River area, so that's, that's what yeah. I was wondering. Yeah, they're there, we just can't find them. We also uh, have been doing a little research with rear end hellbenders at our center. So we actually have some at our center. We also have two at the Slate of Wildlife Education Center if you want to go look at one. Uh, they're in an aquarium in the back 
Uh, so they're pretty, a couple years old, but they're still f fairly large. They're about 14 inches. So for you, you, you have a lot of kind of unique uh, either salamanders or fish species because that's what the mussels attach themselves to very, very early on. Is there a mussel that only uses the hellbender that you know of? We don't know that they use the hellbenders at this point. Uh, there is another mussel called the salamander mussel that uses a mud puppy, which is a very similar species. Okay. Uh, but we think there's a couple of mussels that might use the hellbender, and we're trying to actually see if we can do some research to, to prove that. Okay, fantastic. So that's why, that's one of the reasons we're studying them right there, huh? Jeff from McCreary, um, he's heard old timers talk about rain crows, uh, and that's a crow that show, shows up before or the day before a rain. Is there any truth to this? Well, there is a bird in Kentucky that's called the rain crow, and it's actually a yellow-billed cuckoo. And um, they do kind of tend to make a lot of noise and be apparent before the rain cr comes, but it's just sort of a, um, another name for a yellow-billed cuckoo. Okay. Um, Mark from Jefferson County, do eagles feed on turkey and infant deer? Um, I've, I've not heard of an eagle taking a, a small deer in Kentucky. Um, uh, golden eagles uh, will take turkeys on occasion. Um, you know, bald eagles will mostly focus on fish, waterfowl, and carrion. Yeah, okay. Ed from Hopkins County, it's a Facebook question. Uh, he said he's seen gray, gray, uh, gray egrets for several years, um, they've seen lar large numbers of white ones. What are these and are they common in this area? Um, well, so we do have the great egret in Kentucky and um, I forget what county he was from, but in Western Kentucky, they're not terribly uncommon. And did, what, did he say gray egret or great? He said, it said gray, but it could oh. have been. Well, so my guess would be maybe he's seeing a great blue heron, you know, um, and sometimes great egrets and great blue herons will nest in the same rookery together. Okay. I didn't hear what he was saying, but also yeah. gray makes you think of potential sandhills certain times of the year as well. Well, yeah, and that very well could be. Yeah, and we certainly have those passing through um, twice a year, so. Yeah. Alice from Graves County, is it possible for pygmy rattlesnakes to be in Graves County near uh, Low, Kentucky? I know where Low Kentucky is. Uh, I would say not. Um, not, not. They're, they're just they're right along the edge of Kentucky Lake in Callaway County. Okay. And then uh, right on the other side in Southern Trigg County. It would be if she finds one, get a photo of it, and that would be a really interesting record. You know, it's not impossible. Okay. Mike from Jefferson County uh, wants to know about the grasshopper population. Has there been an increase of grasshoppers this year? Anyone know anything about that? Your birds are eating all the grasshoppers, but apparently they're missing a bunch of them because there's <laughs> a, <laughs> no, no news on that. All right. Jeff from Warren County wants to know if there's any kind of insect control for ticks in Mammoth Cave. Uh, he says state parks. We're talking about national parks. Do we use any type of, uh, in any of our WMAs, do we use anything for tick or mosquito uh, control methods? He's saying they're out of control in uh, Mammoth Cave National Park. Not that I'm aware of. Do we do anything for mosquitoes? I don't, I don't know of anything that would control ticks out in nature. Yeah, yeah. And what about mosquitoes? I know if you in certain city areas they do they do some spraying, but do we they, anything in parks or wildlife um, WMAs? Uh, my experience at Mammoth Cave was if you stay away from the horse trails, the ticks aren't as bad. <laughs> <Is that right? laughs> it seems like yeah. the horse trails get them real bad. But <laughs> All right, there you go. There's a tip for you. Uh, Kathy from Madison County. Are screech owls com common in Madison County? Yeah, they, they certainly are. In fact, there was a screech owl study done in Madison County years ago. All right. All I have is female hummingbirds this year. Where are all the males? I'm not sure. I, Oh, well, they're around. It might just be, um, you know, unlucky that she hasn't come across them. We haven't noticed any sort of unusual sex ratio going on there or anything. Okay. Uh, Sean from Bourbon County, he says that uh, he wants to know about Harrison County and Copperheads. Are there any Copperheads in Harrison County? We have no records of a Copperhead in Harrison County. It's possible, but uh, if you find one there, take a photo of it and... and send it to me. Uh, most copperhead reports I get are, they turn out to be a milk snake or a rat snake or a common water snake. 
You know, a very interesting thing, we get a lot of people asking about their local counties and venomous snakes. Do we have somewhere on the department where you can go put what county you're in and what venomous snakes are found? Uh, I, th I think we actually do have a county. You can search uh, county, you know, species by county. Okay, very interesting. But it's only as good as our records are. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, Gary Cooper from Fleming, Fleming County wants to know about metal arc populations in Fleming County seems to be decreasing. Uh, it could be that the best thing that you can do for meadow larks is not to mow the grass as often. And so um, if, if somebody has been maybe cutting hay more often, that could lead to a decline in meadow larks. And mm -hmm. so less mowing you can do, the more meadow larks you'll have. Fantastic. We're getting a ton of great questions. We're obviously not going to be able to get through all of them tonight. As we said before, you can always reach out to the Department of Fish and Wildlife by calling our info line, which is 1-800-858-1549. And you can always ask a question. You don't have to wait till the non-game call-in show. Uh, you can ask a question of one of these biologists at any point in time. If you have a question on species, it's always good to get a picture and submit that with it so that we're making sure we're talking about the same thing. Uh, we got a lot of great shows coming up on Kentucky Field in the weeks to come. Make sure you tune in. And hunting seasons are right around the corner. We've got uh, a, a, a squirrel season coming up. We've also, on the 1st of uh, September, we've got archery season for deer as well as first day of dove season. So get those shotguns out and get them ready to go. We're gonna finish out with a few questions. Dennis from Henry County, where did all the crawdads go? Uh, depends on where you're at and <laughs> you know, what time of year that you're looking for them. We recently went out and tried to find some. And if you have an area, craw, crawfish, if you get in very deep water, you probably won't find them. You need to be in the shallow areas, right? It depends on the species. <laughs>